I came to this country at the age of 15. I was born in Shanghai and moved to Peru when I was a year and a half. So actually, my first language is Spanish. And it is the only language I can speak without a trace of an accent. <laughs> because I speak Chinese with a Spanish accent, and I speak English with a combination of Spanish and Chinese accent. <laughs> my parents own a small grocery store in Peru. And I started working at that grocery store when I was in fourth grade. And we worked seven days a week, 13 hours a day, and we closed only one day a year, and that was Christmas. And when I was finishing high school, my parents said to me, there's no future for you here. Here is $300, the life savings of your that we, our parents, your parents have, have saved and go to America. So I came to this country alone with no friends, no family, hardly speaking any English. And it was extremely difficult. So I got a very small scholarship at a small college in Iowa. And they allowed me to, they gave me a job washing pots and pans every night. And as a result, I got one free meal a day. So for my years in college, I basically ate crackers for breakfast and lunch, had one free meal. But I was so appreciative to be in a place where there was opportunity. But I must admit that after my fresh, in the middle of my freshman year, when my grades was a C minus minus, about to lose my scholarship, and about to be, you know, kicked out of school. Other people in Iowa stepped forward. They tutored me in English at their homes. A professor took me to a large university called University of Iowa and said to me, one day you will be here and get a PhD degree. And I'm saying, you know, I'm just barely trying to survive my freshman year. And many, many people, I was washing 20 to 25 cars every weekend for $1. And some of those cars were pretty clean until, of course, I realized they were bringing cars to me so I could earn some money. One fast forwards, several decades, I managed to graduate from college, got a PhD, got a law degree, and uh, today I'm the president of a university. That can only happen in America. This is the land of opportunity that given an equal chance, anything is possible. And our obligations as citizens, no longer as sojourners in this country, but as citizens, is to make sure that that opportunity to realize the American dream will live on forever. So let me share with you my perspective on what's happening in this country. When I arrived here in 1961, persons of color were maybe 10% of the entire population. Today it's 25%. Asian Americans and Chinese Americans are one of the fastest growing immigrant groups in this country. Nine terms of total number in percentage increase. What is remarkable to me is that during the years I've been in this country, America has evolved from being a microcosm of Europe to being a microcosm of the world. America is becoming the first 
universal nation in history, a nation of nations. Now, there have been other nations, such as the Roman Empire, such as the former Soviet Union, that were, con that were comprised of groups from all over the place. But they were comprised of groups from all over the world by conquest. America is the first universal nation, pluralistic nation, due to immigration. And of course, the population of Chinese Americans, 5% or so of the population keeps growing. But here is the enormous paradox. On the one hand, we're becoming more and more diverse. In fact, by the middle of the century, we will all be minorities because there will be no majority. We will be a minority ma majority country. The paradox is that the more diverse we become as a nation, the more difficult it is to govern, the more fragmented we are, and we are today truly becoming almost a tribal country. Everybody retreating into their own identities in their own tribes and not really communicating with each other. It used to be throughout the 19th century, early part of the 20th century, we talked about America as a melting pot. We ignored differences. We homogenized people. Everybody became, quote, Americans. That was the melting pot idea. But as we became more diverse, the metaphor changed. We are no longer a melting, a melting pot. We are a mosaic a mosaic with many different tiles, shining brightly, representing different cultures, different backgrounds. But the question I ask you, what holds all these different tiles of that mosaic together? In other words, if this cannot be a United States of America, and it's increasingly becoming a divided States of America, that is a real risk for the heart and soul of our democracy. Just as America has changed us by immigrating here, it is our obligation to help reshape the America of the future. And what is that vision? I believe we need to have a vision of a country that is not only diverse, but it's also inclusive. That everybody has a place. That different ethnic and racial and religious backgrounds need to be respected and celebrated. That these differences are valued. And in other words, the major issue of the 19th and 20th century was to how to diversify America. The biggest issue in the 21st century is how to unify America. So you may remember back in, oh, I think it was around uh, 2004, a young United States Senator gave an electrifying speech in which he said, there is no white America, no black America, no Asian America, no Latino America. There is only the United States of America. And his name was Barack Obama. But this vision of a colorblind society was in fact echoed half a century earlier because I hitchhiked across the country on that really sultry August noon in 1963, hitchhiked across the country to be in the Washington Mall to hear the speech of Martin Luther King when he said, I have a dream 
And my dream is that someday my, be, my children will be judged, not by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. A vision of a post-racial America. Now, I don't know, I'm a realist. I don't believe that this will happen any time in my lifetime. I don't know that it will ever happen because we are so closely identified with our ethnic and racial backgrounds. That is not the point. The point is while being respectful of valuing and being proud of our racial and ethnic backgrounds or sexual orientation or cultural backgrounds, are we also at the same time find ways that we come together and live together in harmony. You know, our national motto, and you take out a coin or a bill, it says in Latin, a pluribus unum. From many, one. For 242 years, we've been striving as a country to form a more perfect union. In other words, a pluribus unum, one out of many. In plain English today, we will say it's about diversity and it is about unity. So other nations are bonded by a common religion, a common race, a common geography, a common language. But to be an American is really a state of mind. We are Americans not because of our ethnicity or our religion or our, our race. We come from many different backgrounds, different perspectives, different beliefs, and that kind of diversity enriches this nation. But ultimately, we are one. What is it that pulls us all together? It is a commitment to certain core values that defines this country and has attracted generations of immigrants to immigrate to this country. And these are values that transcend race. They transcend the politics of red or blue or purple. These are values that are enshrined in the Constitution, values about equal treatment, about fair process, about human dignity. Those values are the moral glue that holds our country together. It is a post-racial vision of what America ought to be. And so a question that, can be, that should be asked, if these are the values, how do we advance them? You have it in the model of United Chinese Americans. And, one of, and the first word is to serve. Back in the 19th century, Alexis de Tocqueville, he was a French aristocrat. He traveled across the country and he wrote a volume called Democracy in America. And it is a classic that everybody reads in college. A classic, not in the sense that everybody quotes and nobody reads. It's a classic in the sense that stands the test of time. And what he observed in the 19th century is that the special quality of this country that gives us its strength is that people come together to help each other out. That it is citizens coming together. It is not what government does that's important. It's important. But more important than what government does is individuals in neighborhoods, in local communities, coming together to help each other. That, he said, is democracy in America. When we help others in our community, we help fellow immigrants, we work with people of different backgrounds and different colors and different countries. What we are engaged in when we're doing that that is citizenship in action. 
that kind of service to society, to our communities, that is the price that we pay to live in a free society. And that, of course, is the mission, or is an integral part of the mission of United Chinese Americans. If all Americans were to engage in this kind of service of helping others, we will truly fulfill our motto, et pluribus unum, one form for many. Thank you very much. We're going to open up for some Q&As. We're going to open up for some Q&As. Um, if you have any questions. Thank you for that inspirational speech, um, Dr. Lo. Uh, George Moy um, from Chicago. I have a question on you in terms of leadership at the highest level. We, we, we tend to talk about the lack of representation of Chinese American and Asian American at the highest level, corporate CEO, your positions, and across every sector. What are you thought about talking about how we could work together to get that to be improving? There is no question that there is a bamboo ceiling. And Look, there are, just in my area, in education, the United States has about 4,500 colleges and universities in the country. Chinese Americans, Asian Americans generally, overall, easily 15%. The percentage of precedents is less than 1%. If you look at the top 100 universities in this country, the top 100 major research universities, where Chinese Americans are easily like UCLA, 20, 25%. Um, you, you know what UCLA stands for? Yeah. Right, United Caucasians lost among Asians. In this whole country of 100 top universities, there are only two Chinese Americans. I'm one of them, the other one is Harry Yang and University of California, uh, Santa Barbara. So the question is, how do we expand that pipeline? And I will direct my remarks to the next generation. You have to step forward. You have to be willing to take on the roles of leadership. And that means training, that means mentoring. That means successful people in United Chinese Americans have to help prepare the next generation. It's not going to happen overnight, but it certainly can happen. Yes. So thank you for your um, insightful speech, uh, President Lu. So I'm I just wondering. Uh, What's the, your upbringing uh, in, in uh, Latin America? Uh, how that experience uh, changed your life? And uh, basically, we wanted, as an Asian American community, how we can better uh, understand the, the Latino community. Um. Well, growing up in South America in the 50s and 60s is very, very different than what it was than it is today. So I haven't been back in 50 years, so I don't know. But suffice to say that there was no opportunity there. For Chinese to be admitted to a local university would be very rare. And so that's why my parents gave me $300 and said bye-bye and sent me to this country. Um, I'm sure it has changed since then. Um, but I can tell you, since I finished, I have been a professor in China at uh, 
Peking University. I've been a professor in Taiwan. I've been a professor in South American countries. I've been a professor in Europe. And I still believe that the great equalizer of conditions in a democracy, in American democracy, is higher education. It's the passport to social and economic opportunity. If you want to rise in this society, which is very achievement oriented, a major avenue for doing that is higher education. So supporting young Asian Americans to be able to have a chance to go to college, and not only to go to college, not only to have a successful career and be successful in life, United Chinese Americans has to prepare them to become active citizens, to be civically engaged, to know how to live responsibly in a free society. And what that means, what that means, the essence of democracy is debate and compromise. It is not, I issue orders and you obey. There are other countries that have leaders for life. There are other countries that tell you what to say or to think, but not here. So you have to debate people, argue with people, because you know human beings have different viewpoints, and do it freely. That's why we have the First Amendment, freedom of expression. We have to listen to views that we disagree with, but yet confront those views. And then, in addition to listening to different views, is we have to compromise. There is no way in this society that you can always get everything you want. If you get everything you want all the time, you're not living in a democracy. You're living in an autocracy. As a president, I have a lot of positions on issues. I can tell you every single one of these issues, faculty members and students dis disagree with, or some group. So remember what Aristotle said 2,000 years ago. Politics is the art of compromise. You have to learn to find the common ground without sacrificing the high ground. And what we have in Washington today and in this country, people no, are no, either no longer able to or they do not know how to compromise. Because the art of democracy is to listen to different views, hear them respectfully, and then find a compromise. Hi, thank you, Dr. Lowe, for a really inspiring speech. Uh, you talk a lot about democracy and being responsible citizens and compromise with differing views. Uh, my name is Miranda Lee, and I'm a first year student at Columbia University on the pre-medicine track, looking specifically at the impact of cultures on the effectiveness of medicine. And as an ABC, an American-born Chinese, I see a growing culture of people who are not really, who the immigrant story is their parents or their grandparents' story. And we're trying to identify as how do we, how do we tread the line between staying true to our cultural roots, but also not go too far along the lines and become tribalist in the sense of only standing for Chinese views. And how do we uh, somehow compromise, I guess, between uh, representing our Chinese and our immigrant stories but also trying to uphold and be responsible democratic citizens? That's a very good question. Uh, you have identified what I believe is the central issue in America today. Now, this is the issue, of course, we have faced in previous times. Remember the poet Yeats who, at the, just before the Second World War broke out, he said, he wrote in a poem, things fall apart, the center cannot hold. The best lack all conviction, and the worst, the worst are full of passionate intensity. We have lost the center in this country. 
We have on the far right the ultra-nationalists. When they want to make return America to a time when it was supposed to be great. And the America that they want to return it to is the white America and the Christian America. And then on the left, we have the woke generation uh, who are so consumed about their own identity. It is one thing to be value and be proud of your identity. It's another one to be exclusively focus on your own identity. Identity politics is tearing this country apart. So I know it goes by different names. They call themselves democratic socialists. On the left, who I call the hard left. Then on the hard right, you have white supremacists, you have America first types. And those who are in the middle, because America has become America because it's always managed to compromise. You swing a little bit to the left, a little bit to the right, and you compromise. We are so polarized that finding the common ground is becoming harder and harder, and this is very much related to technology. When you get news around the clock instantly on social media, and most of that news, number one, may not be accurate, and number two, people are only reading news that fits their preconceptions. That divides this country even more than ever. Um, I can tell you that on my campus, we've brought in people like Jesse Jackson, who was a giant of the civil rights movement. Many young people have no idea who Jesse Jackson is. For them, somebody like Martin Luther King is a historical figure from, the, from back in the Middle Ages. And it's precisely this lack of understanding of American history is part of the problem. If you want to be an engaged citizen, you have to understand the history of your country, its cultures, its values, as well as understanding and valuing the history and the culture of the country that you came from. So, no, I've not been able to answer your question because I don't know, I don't have an answer. It's but okay. I value your question. It's a very good question. Thank you. Hi, Dr. Lo. Hello? Dr. Lo. Um, uh, I, wa uh, I wanted to ask you a question on the lighter side because we have had too many heavy questions and... It's actually out of battery, so <laughs> sorry. Out of battery. Oh, you, you. oh, sorry. Oh, this is much better. I can hear you. Now, now you can hear me, right? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lo. Um, I wanted to ask you a lighter question because we've had too many uh, heavy topics in the last couple of days. You may not know you have become a sports star, actually, in this country, particularly in the college sports circle in this past summer because of your uh, football program lost such a, you know, you had a, such a tragic loss of life this past summer. And your courage to take responsibility for the university and for the program itself actually received a lot of praise. I would like you to talk a little bit about how to be a leader and what it means to you to be a leader in courage, um, particularly in a challenging time uh, like what we are facing now with so many leaders not wanting to take responsibilities and uh, have any accountability. Thank you. Uh, he raised a question about sports. And in the context of that, a student tragically died and um, I took full responsibility. 
I publicly okay. said that on behalf of the university, I accept legal and moral responsibility, which is, of course, very unusual. And I've been roundly criticized by some people and congratulated by others. But let me very briefly put it in context. You remember Howard Cosell, that well-known sportscaster, who loved to say that big-time sports is a microcosm of American life. I would reframe what he said. Big time sports is larger than life in America. Big time sports is the secular religion of America. You look at the New York Times. Every day, there is more coverage of sports, college and professional than there is about education, about culture, and the arts combined. All the issues of American society, of equality, of race, of violence, of cheating, is reflected in sports. And one of the very paradoxical things about American universities, and as you know, I've taught in South America, Asia, Europe, no other country in the world has what I call the sports industrial complex, a major entertainment business in the middle of a university. There isn't. So the reality is that the values of sports are sometimes are sometimes frequently not aligned with the values of a university. As Vince Lombardi, the famous coach of the Green Bay Packers once said, winning is not everything. Winning is the only thing. And my response to that is someday we will all meet that great score in the sky. And when we stand before that great scorer, we will not be asked, how many points did you score? How many games did you win? We will be asked to be held accountable. How did you play the game of life? Because our responsibility is to educate students. And part of the education includes sports. Did you win with honor? Did you lose with grace? But more importantly, did you play with integrity? And did you help your teammates? Those are the qualities that one learns in sports that also translate to life. But far too often, the emphasis is only on winning. And that is when there is the risk of doing things that are inappropriate. So this is an example of how almost every issue that crosses my desk they only cross my desk because they're controversial. If everybody agreed on, those, on how it should be resolved, it will never even cross my desk. And so here is how one has to, as a leader, has to balance on the one hand. The reality is that sports is here to stay. And by the way, as you notice, I'm, I'm digressing here, but for those of you who are sports fans, you know that the US Supreme Court has just legalized sports betting. Illegal sports betting is a $14 billion industry that is done offshore. All of a sudden, this is legal. I spend nights worrying about this. It is only a matter of time before we have point shaving scandals. And this is not just college, even down to the high school level. Some, some guy comes and gives this player, here's $1,000 and make sure you miss a basket in a particular game. So, but that's the reality. We're not going to abolish sports in this country, especially if it is the secular religion in this country. The question is, how do you balance that with the other values that are important and define us as a country? And all I can say is winning is important, but winning is not everything. I don't know if that responds to your question.
Hi, my name is Barbara Hing, and I felt that you and I have a lot in common because I, I grew up in the Philippines and I came over here in 1973. So I've been here over 40 years. Uh, and I love the way you describe America. And that's why I remain here, even though my family want me to go back. Because uh, America is the best country in the world to me. Okay, and what you have described has relieved that, and I really appreciate what you said today. Whatever you said is true. However, since Donald Trump was elected president, I have this fear that this might be taken away from us, or it might set us back maybe 50 years, uh, 60 years, like before, or 30 years before. Now, I like your opinion. How do you feel about it? Because I have fear at this point. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Look, this is why these are fraud times. President Trump did not begin this. He is a symptom of the culture. We've been moving in this direction. It's not that he got elected and all of a sudden we have you know, white supremacists rising, and we have uh, sexual assaults being sort of more or less legitimized, and we have... He got elected because there is a, there's enough people out there who believe this, who feel the same way, who feel disenfranchised. Look, the reality is, a generation, two generations ago, people of color were only 10% of the population. When they read, that by 2050, whites will be 50% of the population only. And they see affirmative action. So that people of certain backgrounds are given, quote, preferences. They feel threatened. And this is happening not only in this country. It's happening in Europe. In democracies in Europe. I was at a conference in Nottingham, England last spring, and I heard that Marie Le Pen was giving a speech in Lille, which is an industrial town in uh, France. So I said, oh my God, I'm going skip, to skip a couple of sessions in the conference, I'm going to take the fast bullet train. And I took the train to go to Lille, and I was at that rally. So that was spring of a year ago. And she is, you know, the far right, and she won something like 30% of the vote. But my God, I'm surrounded by French people, and I speak French fluently, and they were all, sh all chanting, on a chenou, this is our home, i.e., all the rest of you, get out of here. This is what I had seen on black and white old uh, newsreels of rallies of fascists before fascism came to power. So, this is a complex issue. There are many reasons why uh, people are feeling this way, the rise of the far right. Uh, but let me just say this. Somebody earlier asked about the bamboo ceiling. People may disagree. I think we have come a long ways since the Exclusionary Act when Chinese could not even become citizens. We've come a long way since 1965 when the Immigration Act was repealed. Remember, until 1965, the number of people from Asia, all of Asia, to immigrate to this country was 100. 100. But we still have a long ways to go. In a democracy, if you want change instantly, it ain't gonna happen because you have to compromise. The only way you're going to get the kind of change that the woke millennials want on the far left is if you have a revolution. This is what happened during the Civil War. So I gave, look, I may be the president, and I'm very, very fortunate. And I've got to be very careful because I know people are scrutinizing me. Well, you know, this is you know, one of two Chinese Americans who's the president of a major university. So I'm scrutinized very carefully. 
But as I mentioned when I introduced Governor Locke, he applied to the law school in the 1970s. I applied to the same law school at the University of Washington. We were turned down. And in fact, I was not only turned down at the University of Washington Law School, I was turned down at every single law school that I applied. So what did I do? I went to Europe and studied for a while. And when I came back, you know, by early 70s, every single law school that turned me down, five years later, they all admitted me. Nothing changed other than I got a PhD, but they didn't admit me because I had a PhD. It's because affirmative action came into being. That doesn't mean that affirmative action, should, there shouldn't be some changes to it. You know, to have affirmative action for a wealthy upper middle class Chinese family is very different than having affirmative action for some immigrant who just arrived in this country, you know, and the parents are toiling 15 hours a day uh, washing dishes. So there's no easy answers, but I, I, I still believe, I still believe that there's a reason why America has been and will always be a beacon to people from around the world. And that's because of its values. And we have to, this is not, this has nothing to do with President Trump. It has to do with, does the president, does our leader have those values that define this country? And those values is not race, it's not ethnicity, it's not religion. It is values of democracy. Uh, hi, my name is Lawrence Zhu. I'm a junior at Oakton High School, and uh, today we're here representing a group called Branch Out, which is a civic engagement group that goes to um, relatively socioeconomically disadvantaged areas in the greater DC metro area. And we were just wondering if you have any suggestions on. Oh, and we were wondering if you had any suggestions on what we can do to advance the community's goals. And also, um, just a goal for us is if we could get a picture with you after the <laughs> so uh, yeah uh, hey i'd be honored to not just have a picture we can do a selfie <laughs> and you can follow me on twitter at president low i have 57,000 followers and i'm happy to add one more but to your question There are so many things that one can do. Let me, let, me just suggest, let me just point out what we have tried to do at the University of Maryland, which is not to say that that's what you should do and anybody else should do, but it illustrates. Rather than talk about it in the abstract, is to give a concrete example. The concrete example is that there's this sophomore English major about four years ago, and he noticed that in, we have many, many cafeterias, dining halls uh, on campus. I don't you know, have 40,000 students. And all the food that's put out that is not served, that's not consumed, has to be thrown away. You cannot have the food put out and then put in the refrigerator and uh, serve it again. It's against the public health laws. He said, this is an enormous waste of food. We said, you know, nothing we can do about it. So he got together with a, a whole group of other students, and they studied up on the state public health laws. So what they did is they formed a group called the Food Recovery Network. Every night, they will go to all the cafeterias, pick up all the food that's, that's put out but not served, as you know, people have not touched it, package it in accordance to public health regulations, and take it to homeless shelters in Baltimore and Washington. By the end of that year, they were serving or making available to homeless shelters 20,000 meals a semester. But they went a step further. They then took that model of students, volunteers, trained in public health regulations to pick up the food and serve it to those in need rather than throw it away. They formed 
a corporation, a not-for-profit, that corporation, uh, that's not-for-profit, is now in 230 colleges across the country. So last summer, when he appeared on Good Morning America, and the anchor said, wow, so your food recovery network is in over 200 colleges in America. So what's your vision? And he just looked at this reporter in the eye and said, our vision is to end hunger in America. <laughs> what we now have is lots and lots of students doing that. Let me give you another example. We had a competition called uh, Innovation Against Hate. A group of three or four of our computer science students participated in this competition. And they came up with software that somehow, and I'm not a tech person, but that software is able to detect and take action against websites that spread hate messages. So here is the point. You have all heard that when you give somebody a fish, that person has a meal. That's called charity. And we should all engage in charity. But if you teach the person to fish, that person has a meal for a lifetime. That's called public service. But what we're trying to do at the University of Maryland is to take it a step further. Young people come in, and they tried to innovate the fishing industry. Then everybody in the village has food, and you create jobs, and you create prosperity. That's called social innovation. So from charity to service to social innovation and entrepreneurship, and I believe that that's something that young people today can relate to. With that, thank you very much, Dr. Lowe for being so gracious with your time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.